University. And uh, this is the third in a series of seminars that we are hosting this fall under the Janak Raj Lectures. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have this topic presented by one of my colleagues, Clint Carter, who's now the director of USA, Utility Service Alliance, uh, which is contracted by the US Department of Energy to improve the operation of our nation's nuclear fleet. So a little background on the talk and background on Clint before I uh, have Clint start his presentation. Uh, what this presentation uh, covers is a collaborative, collaborative industry scale project hosted by USA Util Utility Service Alliance. It was made possible by the US Department of Energy and this research and development project is designed to demonstrate how advanced technologies can be applied to preserve the economic competitive, competitiveness of the nation's nuclear power industry. Capabilities being developed and evaluated as part of this Internet of Things, IoT, demonstration include integrated field sensing system, automated automated machine learning analytics and centralized monitoring and diagnostics. I'm so pleased to say that I had many years of experience working with Clint and I learned a lot while he was the pioneer and brought this technology in the forefront of where power industries are doing these days. It is expected that much of the resultant learnings can be directly applied to other industries, including fossil generation, renewables, oil and gas and other large-scale industry, industry operations. The final work product will consist of a single unified platform encompassing all capabilities, a business case valuation assessment and recommendation, recommendations for further expansion. A little bit about Clint, as I mentioned, I've had a very pleasant experience of working with him for more than a decade. He serves as a director of fleet modernization for the USA. In this capacity, he's a principal investigator for implementing the advanced remote monitoring and diagnostic services, a DOE sponsored initiative to research, design and develop technology based solutions across nuclear energy facilities to improve efficiencies while lowering operating expenses. Mr. Carter has 37 years of electric utility experience, including expertise gained through a variety of positions at the Comanche Peak Nuclear Power Plant in Texas, where he was a licensed senior reactor operator, a pioneer of the industrial internet. Carter led the de development of the world's largest wireless indus industrial infrastructure supporting voice communication, mobile computing, and equipment condition monitoring at Comanche Peak. He was the original architect of Vistra's Power Optimization Center. Today, the POC is recognized as the gold standard for delivering advanced monitoring and diagnostic services to nuclear, fossil, and renewables generating facilities across the nation. As an, as an entrepreneur, he successfully commercialized the POC model in both domestic and international markets. In collaboration with EPRI, Clint conducted basic research and was involved in the development of numerous industry guidelines for de developing, for deploying advanced technologies and power stations. In the academic sector, Clint previously served on engineering advisory boards at the University of Texas at, Texas at Arlington and at Lehigh University. Carter was a founder and board member of Azima, an internet-based advanced analytics predictive technologies. He holds a BS in nuclear engineering from Kansas State University, an MS in engineering technology from University of North Texas, and an MBA from Texas Christian University. So Clint, thank you for willing to present to our student audience and other industrial audiences too, and the floor is yours. Well, Thank you, Dr. Shankar, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I look forward to uh, giving you an overview of the work that we're doing at the Utility Service Alliance, um, the Advanced Remote Monitoring and Diagnostics um, 
project. And uh, so what I'll do here momentarily is I'll, I'll share my screen and then we'll uh, walk through the slides. And I believe after that, we'll have a, a question and answer session that, that follows that. So um, <clears throat> I'll go ahead now and try and share my screen. And... Okay, you should be able to see my screen. Perfect. Okay, so uh, fleet-wide monitoring of power industry assets. So we'll we'll be talking about how technology that is that is evolved over, oh, let's say, over the last twenty years in the area of advanced monitoring and diagnostics in the industrial sector. How. Uh, this technology has grown, added value uh, to uh, to the power industry through uh, remote monitoring and, and diagnostics of, of emerging issues. And as a part of the advanced remote monitoring project, we will be talking about how we are now, under this DOE-sponsored initiative, applying that technology to help preserve uh, the nuclear power industry. And... Um, so with that, I'll just jump in. To, I'll just jump into the presentation. Okay, a little bit about my company, the Utility Service Alliance. The USA Alliance. It is a. It is a not-for-profit cooperative. We were founded in uh, the mid 1990s, and we have a number of member. Uh, our members comprise nuclear utilities from across the country. We have uh, eight different nuclear utilities that represent nine nuclear stations with uh, 14 reactors and more than uh, 15,000 megawatts of combined generation. Our members in the USA Alliance represent uh, mainly the smaller single one or two site uh, nuclear utilities. Some nuclear utilities like Exelon, now Constellation, Entergy, and others, maybe Southern, have multiple nuclear sites. In our members' cases, they may just have one nuclear site. And so it's difficult for a single nuclear unit, you know, from a business perspective, to realize the economies of scale being part of a much larger fleet. And so what we do through our for, through the USA cooperative is we bring those smaller nuclear utilities together and enabling us to realize economies of scale when we go out and for service contracts or purchase materials and equipment for our facilities we can make a better deal uh, being part of a larger cooperative and so that's the real mission behind the USA alliance is to help us uh, be more economically competitive and stronger with a with a larger voice, and so uh, with as always a focus on achieving and maintaining high levels of of nuclear safety and cost effective operations for our members. And so we'll get into we'll get into the to the story. So it all it all began. The nuclear power industry actually began in the early 1950s. It, uh, think back to those times, think back to your history, <laughs> uh, high school history here. Um, we were in the midst of a, a Cold War with, uh, with Russia, this, well, the Soviet Union in those days. And there was a lot of anxiety uh, post-World War II and with that war being concluded with uh, the atomic, well, the atomic blasts in Japan, there was a lot of anxiety around the world and who controlled nuclear power. And, and um, so uh, in 1953, President Eisenhower addressed the concerns of, you know, this new nuclear future that has, that had, that had been born. And he committed the United States to share nuclear technology that was created out of the war effort, but to do so 
for the benefit of all mankind, for peaceful applications. And so the program, the speech and the program that came out of that uh, was dubbed Adams for Peace. And so Eisenhower started back then. And so we made available nuclear technology, nuclear science uh, from the military and, and made it available in the public sector and made it available to begin research and development uh, that led to the creation of nuclear power plants and, and, um, and being able to generate electricity from nuclear power. And so since uh, the beginning, since the early 1950s, this chart represents uh, between 1957 when we began developing commercial nuclear power and through, through 2020. And you can see the generation capacity of the United States nuclear fleet growing over those years. And you can see there on the left, the nuclear footprint as of 2020, there were um, 55 operating nuclear plants, 93 reactors across 28 states. And that's actually down a bit. You can see on the right in 2012, the industry in the United States peaked at 104 nuclear reactors. And uh, so we have leveled out and some plants are beginning to shut down. Some are at end of life and, and some are shutting down for other re reasons that we will be exploring. Um, as of 2020, you can see on the pie chart that nuclear represents almost 20% of the total generation capacity of our nation. And interestingly enough, that 20% nuclear represents uh, over 50% of our nation's carbon-free uh, electric generation source. Nuclear power plants generate zero carbon. And so uh, truly a, a, clean, a clean source of reliable electric power. So uh, one thing to note, since we're updated the slide a bit here. So as of uh, today, we're now, we've lost another plant here in recent months. So we are now down to 54 plants and 92 operating reactors uh, across our nation. And so uh, that's, you know, this, this decline in recent years, particularly from 104 to reactors to 92 is, is, is what our, uh, is what our project is targeting. Um, it's what we're targeting to try to mitigate more uh, reactors prematurely having to shut down. And so we'll talk about that shortly. All right, so today, so nuclear power, 20% of our, of our generation capacity that's online. Nuclear power has, uh, has become critical for maintaining our nation's energy security, the stability of our electric grid, and uh, achieving our environmental goals. If we are to reach uh, uh, you know, the goals of uh, the international community in terms of, of mitigating climate change and reducing uh, uh, global heating, uh, it, is, uh, it is a fact that this cannot, we cannot meet those goals of less than two degrees Celsius temperature rise and with the necessary carbon reduction without preserving and growing uh, nuclear power. There's just no other technology that can scale, that's available today to scale to these levels in, in the time frame we need. So the challenge, I've mentioned the plants, some of the plants have been shutting down. Nuclear powers, the economic competitiveness of the industry is diminishing, has been diminishing due to due primarily to disrupt the application of, uh, of uh, the introduction of disruptive technologies on the industry. And we're gonna talk about uh, that disruption and, and where it's coming from and how it's impacting us. But think about you know, uh, gas fracking technologies and energy efficiency improvement technologies. Uh, it's turned it's turned the tables um, on on the on nuclear. Back in the early days of Atoms for Peace, 
uh, the promise of nuclear power was almost too cheap to meter. And indeed, for many decades, nuclear power was the cheapest electric generating source on Earth. Um, that cost increased over time due to uh, additional regulatory burden that, that was assumed over the years. And, and then um, as gas fracking technologies uh, emerged and market pricing, the, mar the market just collapsed. And all of a sudden, uh, nuclear has now one of the most expensive uh, generation sources. And, um, and so nuclear is struggling to remain competitive. We also have increasing production costs that go along with the lowering market prices, but uh, it is causing challenges. For example, you may have heard just a few months ago, uh, the Palisades nuclear plant has been operating for 50 years uh, up in, Mich uh, in uh, Michigan, yeah, was shut down in May of this year and with uh, many years still left on its operating license. And they closed uh, because of economics. They cannot compete because of their operating costs today relative to uh, cheap uh, natural gas. And you, if we take, it's not an isolated situation either. Um, this, about this time last year, Indian Point closed, uh, which was in looking across these other plants, we've had a number of nuclear power plants close prematurely, primarily because they are no longer economically competitive. And, and just to put this into perspective, how impactful this is, one of these large nuclear power plants closing down, you know, round number, let's say a, a thousand megawatt nuclear power plant, it's putting a thousand megawatts of electricity, a thousand million watts on the electric grid. When that goes, and it's all carbon free. And if we replace, if just shutting down one of those plants and replacing it, let's say, with natural gas fired uh, power, natural gas, that additional carbon contribution to the environment from by replacing nuclear with gas offsets the zero carbon benefits of all solar generation facilities that we have developed across the entire nation to date just one of these plants. And, and that's to a, an earlier point that, you know, we cannot address carbon um, or global warming and reduce carbon emissions to the levels that must be achieved at a global scale without this, without remarkable, without this type of remarkable technology that, that, that nuclear uh, has delivers. So, um, how do we sustain these legacy nuclear power plants and, and build a future for next generation nuclear? Well, nuclear sustainability mandates that we reduce, we find ways to reduce our operating expenses. We technologically innovate these power plants that uh, have been running for many decades. Migration from analog technologies to digital and automation of, uh, of processes that are done in a very costly and manual fashion over the years. So bottom line, nuclear sustainability means that we must transform our business processes. And it is an imperative that we accelerate the pace that we're going, or there will be more plants like these plants that are forced to prematurely shut down simply because of economics. So. I've, I've mentioned uh, what's going, you know, high level, you know, technological disruption, uh, gas fracking, market collapse and that sort of thing. Well, what, you know, this is, this is nothing new. Many industries have experienced this. And, uh, and so we're going through it in the nuclear industry at this time, as is the entire electric power industry. So what's going on in the external environment that's, that's driving all this big picture? So there is a revolution 
going on. It's not the kind of revolution that maybe the father of our country fought, but there is nonetheless a revolution. Klaus Schwab, the, the founder of the, of the World Economic Forum, he talks about this revolution as, as a technological revolution. He talks about this revolution that will ultimately alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. Scale, scope, and complexity. This transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. And Schwab calls this the fourth industrial revolution. Powerless when they encounter a traffic jam, but a growing body of research suggests individual drivers can have an impact. Someone might be unmuted. I, I hear something about a traffic jam. <laughs> William Reedy, an electrical engineer in Seattle. Okay, so fourth, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. So th what this means is we must have been through three before this. So just to kind of to put a perspective on things, this is what Schwab was talking about was, was um, the industrial revolutionary processes and eras that we've gone through. So it all began in the 1800s, the first industrial revolution. This was represented by mankind uh, harnessing the power of water and steam and being able to apply it to industrial processes to become more efficient. The second industrial revolution um, led to uh, mass production of, of goods and materials through the, through the development and application of electric energy and also uh, division of labor, taking uh, the workforce and training specialists to focus on uh, to focus their skills and capabilities in a certain area, and then assembling all of that uh, strategically to optimize production processes, so mass production. The third industrial revolution, in, again, in the, sometime in the 1970s, with the application of, of computers on a large scale basis in, in industrial uh, processes. So automation through uh, computers, electronics, uh, uh, information technologies. So that's the third industrial revolution. And so today, the fourth industrial revolution represents um, a merger of physical systems with, with the, the cyber systems that were developed as part of the, the third revolution and applying cyber intelligence as well to the processes. So the machines can actually measure, monitor, analyze, and make corrections in, uh, in uh, mechanical, in any processes. Uh, based upon uh, based upon the environment and what's occurring, and then learn from that. So, cyber intelligence, and so the technologies that are that we're all getting pretty comfortable with these days didn't exist, uh, have been existed for very long. You know, autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, driver, you know, cars that drive themselves, three D printing. Uh, many applications that we see today uh, is being brought about by this fourth industrial revolution, and it's only beginning. And so with, with that in mind, the fourth industrial revolution is, is, a, is, is going to be an immensely disruptive uh, transition over time. And many, many um, well, humankind, just as Schwab said, it's going to be, it's going to revolutionize our entire way of life. And so Sputnik to Uber, I wanted to talk about this for a minute because we're, we're really reliving, um, through, through very similar, uh, global transformations once again, and, and we can always learn from history, always look back and, and, and you'll find analogies in the past that can that can help you appreciate what you know. We're not doing all this for the first time. So Sputnik, you know, back in the mid '50s, back to the Cold War, 
the Soviet Union put an artificial satellite in space and Americans back then in the 1950s could see that Soviet uh, object, you know, standing out in their backyards at night and it polarized us. There was immense fear that we were losing grounds and how long would it be before, you know, some foreign entity had the ability to to, you know, to, to cause us harm from, from the skies. And so it polarized our nations. It, it polarized our nation and led to uh, uh, John F. Kennedy's commitment to put, a, to put a person on the moon by the end of the decade. The space race was born out of, out of that uh, disruption. And, and so Uber, you know, that's an example today of how the fourth industrial revolution is disrupting, you know, legacy businesses. Think about what Uber, you all, I know you all appreciate what, what Uber has done to the, to the taxi industry. They're just one of the more recent industries that have been disrupted by technologies. And we can learn from others. Uh, some of you may remember Kodak. They used to be the largest uh, camera photographic film uh, company on earth. And, uh, but they were based in the analog world and their business model was um, develop, sell, manufacturing, selling film, developing that film, uh, making photographs. And um, they, you know, with the advent of digital photography, they chose not to change their core business. They felt they could sustain and they didn't think that digital was going to have a, a, a very large future. In fact, Kodak developed the first digital camera and they put it in a closet somewhere and, and uh, ignored, they, well, they actually stood up a business unit, but they did not transform their core business. They stuck with, with film and photography because they did not believe what, they, they, they couldn't see what was happening to the industry. Today, uh, Kodak, um, well, they went bankrupt. I, I think there is, there is a small entity left today, but nothing like it was before. We all have one of these in our in our pocket or our purse, and um, <clears throat> you know the capabilities that's on the iPhone today. If you were to go out, let's say in the let's say in the mid 1980s, and went and bought the video cameras and the tape recorders and all of the you know the the music players, Walkman, what we called them back in those days. If you bought all went and bought all that stuff, you it would cost you almost a million dollars and you have that capability you know, in your pocket now and we and so think about all of the industries that were disrupted when the iphone and everything that it enables has come along and so now so these all represent disruption as new technologies come along and so now disruptive technologies are demonetizing the nuclear power industry and so that's what we are focusing on, on, uh, on, on, on trying to uh, minimize the impact of, to, to preserve legacy nuclear power for our benefit. And so Utility Service Alliance. So this, uh, we launched the Advanced Remote Monitoring and Diagnostic Services Project <coughs> to target um, to target preserving nuclear power. And so our vision with this project is to preserve the economic competitiveness of our nation's nuclear energy supply by transforming our core business processes through the application of advanced technologies. And so this is a $14 million effort that you can see the, uh, the member utilities and their nuclear power plants that are participating it's a $14 million project funded by the Department of Energy through a, and a, through a grant and also in collaboration with Idaho National Lab that is leading the research and development effort. And as a matter of fact, I might point out some of the, some of the fundamental research in support of this uh, was actually performed 
uh, by uh, uh, by Lehigh as as a part of this project as well. So we certainly appreciate the contributions there. And so we have three objectives in the advanced remote monitoring pro project. We call it ARM. So objective one is to uh, how are we going to drive costs out of the nuclear power industry while preserving safety, nuclear safety, reliability, and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So three objectives here. First is to create a shared services technology platform that will enable objective two, the, the transformation of our nuclear business processes. And lastly, to evaluate uh, the value of 24 seven monitoring and diagnostic services and how that could be applied to the nuclear power industry to preserve high levels of safety while reducing operating costs. And I talk about the transformation of our business processes with technology. There's, there is a unique, uh, one of the unique uh, attributes of nuclear power plants is when, you, when compared to let's say coal or natural gas, fossil plants, the single largest cost operating costs for fossil plants is the fuel, the coal that's shipped in over the rail or the natural gas that has to be processed and, and, and pushed through uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of miles of, of, of piping to reach, reach those plants. Fuel is the most expensive. In nuclear, uranium is actually, for the energy density of uranium, it is very cheap. The single largest cost of any nuclear power plant is the workforce. The number of people that it takes to manage the plant, all of the regulatory burden that's been imposed on this industry, very, very expensive. And in fact, let's say we have a, a nuclear power plant that's, that was operating in the late 1970s, might've had 300 employees. And that same plant operating today has over 600 employees because of the regulatory burden, the overhead that we have placed on these plants over many, many decades. So the idea here is if we can automate data collection from these power plants, automate analytics of the data, automate reporting, automate notifications, automate regulatory compliance, we can reduce the, the, the costs that we have to invest in, in, in the human workforce and, and preserve the competitiveness of these, of these uh, zero carbon sources of, of electricity. So I'm gonna talk about each of these objectives and uh, give them a little more detail. So objective one, creation of a shared services platform. We call this platform New Suite, and so this is a standard. This is a standard software platform that can be shared across all participating nuclear utilities to automate their business processes, so they can reduce their operating costs. And each of these um, New Suite is built on three pillars. First. Uh, is redesign of business processes. I mentioned that most of our business processes today are we've, we're doing the same way that we've done them for decades uh, in a very manual process. And we haven't had the opportunity to automate and to simplify the processes through technology. And so redesigning our business processes, we've got to simplify them, streamline them, standardize them so we can share them. Uh, between utilities and automate the practical extents possible to reduce uh, manpower. Next pillar is analytics. And so this represents uh, first principles, uh, multi-brand analysis, and now machine learning and artificial intelligence. So packaging up the analytics that can help us as we work to automate these business processes. And lastly, online monitoring. So pulling information out of the plant. So we have through the plant computer or, or in some cases, the, the digital control systems, all the plant 
process data that's available now based upon installed instrumentation. Also, we have other, we've expand, we are expanding through wireless sensing capabilities uh, so we can gather even more intelligence um, as well as applying app, uh, mobile sensing technologies such as using drones and robots. And we'll, and we'll talk more about that later. So bringing together these three pillars in the new suite environment, we are able to develop what we call transformation modules. And so each of these modules targets a specific workflow activity in a nuclear power plant. And so this transformation model module essentially takes the place of the, it replaces the legacy application with a corresponding cost reduction. For example, automation of operator walk around inspections. That one module, if we can automate those, ins those routine area inspections, that's a cost savings of a million and a half dollars a year. It's, it's, that, it's that kind of an approach. So the transformation modules represent the integrated an integrated business solution that can be applied and then shared. And so, okay, well, that's all neat. And why? We've talked about the cost savings, but there's the benefits that surround this. Uh, this is owned by the participating utilities. Today, a nuclear plant, a utility has dozens and dozens of software license agreements and maintenance agreements and systems don't talk to each other. We can't afford that model anymore. We, we need to consolidate, reduce the number of software providers to just a few key uh, providers. And, and one of the challenges we have today is if we go out and build our, our workflow process, for example, on a third party's software platform, then at some point, our business is dependent on that platform and, and they can raise our software license fees and our maintenance fees and it's beyond our control. And so New Suite enables us to regain control so, and it will scale organically to meet our business requirements, and it'll scale at a pace that makes sense for us. And it will also become a, a repository to share operating experience and knowledge between utilities. We are building this with uh, on an open open source architecture to the maximum extent practical. So again, we're not beholding to numerous third parties, software, you know, software fees and that sort of thing. But we do recognize that utilities have legacy investments in their existing technology infrastructures. These legacy historians and telecommunications infrastructure, new suite, we're building interfaces so we can still take advantage of the millions and millions of dollars of infrastructure that are already in place. So the idea here is we don't want to throw away everything and start from scratch. We want to take what's there, leverage it to optimize, to extract the maximum value, but also bring it together into an environment to add additional value. Objective two, the transformation of the nuclear business processes. So the transformation modules as part of the DOE project, these are them. So there's seven of them. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these, but just give you a view of what we're going after. So we have, uh, I'm, I'll just click a couple of times, get all this on here. So left to right, top to bottom. So thermal performance, developing the ability to see online the thermal efficiencies real time of any nuclear plant if valves start leaking or pipes start leaking, to be able to recognize that near real time and be able to pinpoint where in the power plant we're losing efficiencies. So the operators can go and take, cor take corrective action to minimize losses because those thermal efficiencies, if you're losing steam or water from your, from your power process, you're not able to generate as much electricity to put on the grid, hence less revenue coming from the operation. So real-time thermal performance monitoring. Next, online transformer monitoring. The idea of large equipment at, at power plants, monitoring it online, real time around the clock, 
and applying advanced analytics to recognize at a very small uh, level of detail when something, uh, uh, when some kind of uh, emergent issue is happening. The idea is to avoid unplanned downtime, to maximize uptime and, and production. Third, Firewatch. Uh, we have people, as we speak, are walking through nuclear power plants, going room to room, checking off or looking for fires. <laughs> you know, walk in a room, okay, no fire, check. Go to the next room, no fire yet, check. Just because we don't have a complete capability to see every area that we need to. And so we've been doing these manual fire watches for decades. The idea here is to automate, put in a, a develop a portable cart so that when a roving or a dedicated fire watch is required because your fire protection system is being worked on or whatever, you can put this thing in there. It'll communicate wirelessly and through advanced intelligence and sensing capabilities, it can recognize smoke, uh, fire, it'll distinguish between is that smoke or is that steam, you know, uh, but be able to use machine learning intelligence to rec to discriminate fire or or some other source that could look like uh, some, uh, you know, something that's associated with fire. That right there is half a million dollars of savings a year if we can do away with these manual fire watches. Radiological management. So the idea of centralizing uh, the monitoring of radiation environments in the plant and monitoring the, the workers that have to go into those areas to do routine act maintenance activities. So monitoring that from a central location to reduce the, the human uh, workforce requirements to, to, do, to, to conduct activities and reduce radiation exposure to the workforce. Process anomaly detection, advanced machine learning algorithms that will be applied to thousands of points in the plant to recognize anomalies and, and generate alarms at a very discrete level. I've mentioned earlier, uh, no, I haven't mentioned this one yet, Shifley surveillances. So for example, at my plant, every, every 12 hours, we send operators out to go into 150 different rooms to read an analog temperature gauge on the room, make sure that it's less than X number of degrees in that room. Well, in the 30 years we've been doing that, we've never, <laughs> we've never hit one of those high temperatures, but we spend hours and hours every day walking around with a clipboard or today an electronic handheld, reading gauges and recording the number. So in this project, we will be putting wireless temperature transmitters in all of those areas, and these shiftly surveillances will be automatically generated rather than and saving hours every day of operate very valuable operations personnel walking around <laughs> reading analog temperature gauges. It's just ridiculous. Operator rounds. Uh, I have talked about this one previously. Automating, you know, again, we walk, spend hours walking through the plants, looking in the rooms, making sure everything looks okay. The technology, you know, we will be applying acoustics and video and gas sensing technologies and these sort of things to monitor the critical environments so we can reduce uh, the human investment to conduct routine inspections just to verify everything's the way that it should be. So those are the transformation modules that we're targeting as part of the project. Lastly, Establishing 24-7 monitoring and diagnostic services and to evaluate how we, this can be applied to reduce costs and improve reliability in nuclear. So this is the Power Optimization Center at, at Vistra. This is my home company. Um, and this center is a 24-7 operation. Uh, we are literally monitoring Oh, fit round number 55 power plants across the nation today. That represents over a hundred uh, generators. And so that's natural gas, coal, nuclear. Uh, we mon are monitoring a number of solar facilities now and battery storage systems. So as part of the ARM project, we are now monitoring in addition to our single unit 
or our single plant, Comanche Peak, we're monitoring the two units of the Susquehanna Nuclear Station in Pennsylvania. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Susquehanna and also the Columbia Nuclear Station up in uh, Washington State. And so uh, one thing that I would like to talk about is I'm, I'm going to expand a little bit on the POC and give you some of the history behind it. And it'll help you appreciate what this kind of service can do for for uh, generating uh, generating facilities. So some success stories from uh, the from the Power Optimization Center. The center has been around for 17 years now. It started in Texas, and um, again, it's grown to uh, to national scale these days. So this was uh, <clears throat> we built the plant and put it online. I will remember this day, April 1st, 2000, uh, 2000, 2009, no, whatever year it was now, 2005, that's right. Okay, so this is the first day of the operation after three months of building this center. We got an alarm on a fan at one of our coal plants. And we, uh, you know, when we turned on the center and all the, the monitoring, on day one, we had thousands and thousands and thousands of false alarm, false alarm, false alarm. But there was one we came across on this primary air fan that um, looked real. And we said, well, what should we do? Let's call the plants. So we called the control room and said, this is a power optimization center in Dallas, Texas. You've got a problem with one of your fans. Well, they had never heard of the, of the power optimization center and they thought we were crazy. But after we explained who we were, what, what we are doing, they said, okay, we get it. We'll go look at our fan. So they went out, they're running at full power. They went and looked at the fan. You can see a photograph on the right. And what they found was they had an emergent oil leak on, uh, <clears throat> on one of the main bearings in this fan. And the draft of the fan had pulled the oil out of the bearing housing saturated the fan blades and coal dust had collected on the fan blades. It was causing a little bit of unusual vibration. And that vibration was what triggered an alarm in our center in Dallas. So this large fan was in a, was in a catastrophic failure mode and was going to fail in a handful of days, but they were, they'd had no idea and they had no capability to recognize this before failure. They did have a planned outage the following day for about two days, and they were able to shut down, repair this fan during the outage, and come back online with the fan uh, in great shape. So had this gone on, the power plant would have tripped, and it, it would have been down for weeks, if not months, um, uh, Rep repairing, replacing this fan that would have failed catastrophically. This was day one, and we we nicknamed this the shot heard around the world. It uh, it got it got our companies and all of our power plants attention. Uh, day one, we saved a power plant from tripping offline. Here's another gas plant. A number of years later, we got a high temperature on one of their main power transformers. The transformers are the thing that take the electricity from the plant's generator and uh, and step the voltage up and put it on the grid so that it can be sent out to everyone's homes and cities and so forth. Well, the temperatures were screaming up on, on this transformer. So we call the control room and say, there's something going on with your transformer. And, and the operator said, there must be something wrong with your monitoring center because Trust me, if that transformer had temperature problems, my control board would be lit up like a Christmas tree and it's dark. There is nothing wrong with my transformer. And so, but they said, but you're good guys, we'll go look at it. So they went out and they looked at the transformer that's here on the left. And, and what they found is you can see those fans on the sides, those fans were all off. And the pumps, these are the cooling fans for these big uh, transformers that uh, and so they ran around all oh, all cooling was off and this thing is generating you know 400 million watts of power and putting that out on the grid and there is no cooling this thing is in a a in this 20 plus year old transformer is on a 
is going to fail and it's going to be a bad thing, big fire and all that. Well, they ran around and they found a power supply breaker that had been left open from some maintenance that had been done over the weekend. And this was their first time they'd started up since then. They closed that breaker. And you can see on the right there, the temperature is ramping up. And then you can see the temperature is coming back down very, very quickly. Well, that's when they turned power back on and cooled off and everything was fine. So catastrophic transformer failure avoided. And given the age of this plant, that would have been the end of this gas-fired power plant. This plant is still running today. And so this is a situation where the POC literally saved an entire generating facility to continue to provide service and, uh, uh, to the community. One interesting thing here uh, from an engineering perspective, this was a latent engineering design issue. You know, that power supply breaker that killed all those pumps and fans, the cooling system, it fed something else. It fed the relays that generated the alarms in the control room uh, when there was a problem with the transformer. So when they left that breaker open, the control room was literally flying blind. And so they never would have seen this before catastrophic, a catastrophic event happened. Last example, this is a nuclear one. This is at Comanche Peak. And so the plant's running along one day at 100% pat reactor power. And all of a sudden they have a, a critical pump trip. And by design, the plant automatically reduces power. It's called a run back. Runs back from 100% to 70% power. And the plant should stabilize there. So this heater drain pump trips. The plant is runs back to 70% power. And it wasn't a normal run back. There were some valve issues. And so the control room operators, the reactor operators were really scrambling, trying to stabilize the plant. Meanwhile, in our monitoring center in Dallas, we were getting alarms on the pump that just tripped, high temperature alarms on the bearings. So they called the control room in the middle of a nuclear transient from 100 miles away and said, we think you got a problem with your heater drain pump. And the operator was in a frenzy and wasn't, wasn't particularly in the mood. And he says, you guys are crazy. That pump just tripped. We don't care about it anymore. We're trying to stabilize the plant. Uh, and at, after a bit of dialogue back and forth, he said, that thing tripped. We don't care. And he says, we know it tripped. That's why you're, we're calling you. Can you believe the bearing temperatures are screaming up on that pump and it's off? How can that be? And so the operators finally got their attention. They said, you're right. And so they sent somebody out into the plant to look at the pumps and an operator out. Come to find out that that pump that should have been in standby was, was still rotating, but in the reverse direction at high speeds because a check valve, a discharge check valve and the discharge flow didn't seat, didn't close when the pump tripped off the way it should have. So a running pump that's, that runs in parallel was reverse flowing this pump and cooling to the bearings is only provided when the, when the, the impeller is rotating and the pump is rotating in the forward direction. So there's no lubrication. So they manually isolated the pump. They did lose one bearing, but they saved all the other bearings from damage. And so this is an example where remote monitoring uh, prevented catastrophic failure of a large critical nuclear asset and saved them weeks and weeks of outage time because of seeing that. Okay, so what I've just outlined, those three objectives, building the new suite, transformation of business processes, and evaluation of the value of, of centralized monitoring and, and diagnostic. That's ARM, the current project. We call it phase one. But we have just submitted an application for a phase two grant application to continue uh, this transformation of our industry's business processes. So phase two represents this submittal. It represents an expansion of the participants in the project, as well as the adoption of additional technologies. 
And our focus as part of phase two is the deployment of mobile sensing technologies, drones and robotics, and integrating them into, uh, into our ultimate new suite solution. And so all this is pretty, pretty neat stuff. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, positioning advanced technologies will help sustain the nuclear's future for, for everyone's benefit. But we're just at the beginning. The DOE money that, that, we're, that, that we're taking advantage of now, it, that's a finite resource and it can only go so far. The idea here is we are trying to, to you know, this is an industry demonstration, but in order to build these technologies at scale, we're going to have to be committed to doing it and, and make a larger investment. And, and so the journey is really only beginning. And as with any journey, if you don't know where you're going, uh, how do you know when you get there, right? So that's what this is all about. So here's the new suite. And <clears throat> our ultimate uh, vision of what new suite can can become and what it can do for our industry. So New Suite ultimately represents the bringing together three elements. So cognition, human cognitive capabilities and synthetic cyber cognitive capabilities through machine learning and artificial intelligence. Sensing capabilities, all of the, seal, the, the field sensors that we have out in the plant, the point sensing technologies, pressure, temperature, flow, combined with field, audio, uh, temperature, video, thermal imaging, uh, gas detection, that sort of thing, all of the sensory capabilities. And then lastly, as part of phase two, the introduction of motor capabilities. You know, the sensing capabilities we have now in the plant, they're all fixed. Is they're nailed on a wall, they're, you, you put a pressure transmitter sensor in a pipe and that's what you're gonna monitor. You're gonna monitor the temperature of the water in that pipe forever. Drones are, are different. Robots, they, they now enable the ability of having sen mobile sensors that can move around, that can fly around or walk through the facilities. So mobile sensing capabilities and the marriage of all three of these things in around this new suite environment to create what we term is a, as a, a teleautonomous ecosystem for the nuclear power industry. That's a mouthful. And we didn't create that terminology. You can go Google teleautonomous ecosystems. You'll find some IEEE literature on it and some other literature. This is the same strategy that other industries are applying. Industries that are looking at driverless uh, fleets of vehicles and, and fleets of large uh, cargo transports that would be largely unstaffed, that would be operated remotely from remote and autonomously. So this is the same model that other industries are using that are that are positioning themselves in the fourth for the fourth industrial revolution. And so this is ultimately what we can do uh, for the nuclear industry. This is our adapt adaption of, of that. And so ultimately what this represents at the end of the day is something like this. Think of all of the engineering and technical support that is that is applied today to help maintain the op and to maintain the nuclear power plants and support the operating crew. The idea here is this ultimate application of technology and centralization of all of this could bring about a facility such as this that that could uh, that could monitor the power plant with a much smaller workforce in a much more cost competitive way. So centralizing these capabilities, this could be the system engineering organization of the future for a fleet of nuclear power plants that would be staffed by representatives from those power plants, experts from those power plants where they could share operating experience. And this could be a physical center or it could be a virtual center with the way technology is today, just like we're having a virtual meeting with all of you today, uh, even though we're hundreds of miles apart. 
And so people ask me, but what is the person sitting in the chair? What is that person's job? Well, that person's job is, is to feed the dog. And uh, the dog actually has the most important job in the room. Uh, the person has the second most important job. Uh, the person's job is to feed the dog. And the dog's job is to bite the person if he tries to touch anything. So engineering and technical support center of the future. Stakeholder benefits, I think we've talked about this. Ultimately, the benefit to the USA members is the automation of complex and burdensome tasks, sustaining or strengthening nuclear safety, performance and reliability, and being to, able to objectively evaluate the potential value contribution of our plants through this federally funded industry demonstration. For the nuclear industry, we're developing a strategic roadmap for technological transformation, supporting business case. And for our nation, the idea of sustaining large scale benefits of nuclear power to preserve uh, grid reliability, energy security, and to meet our environmental goals. And so, and with that, um, kind of in conclusion, technological disruption is and environmental priorities and economic realities are bringing together a transformation of the electric utility industry and working together our industry as always will, will rise to the cause and we will working together preserve atoms for peace. I have one more slide that concludes the presentation but if you would like more information in the last page, there's contact information for USA. Also, about this time last year, there was a, a feature editorial in Nuclear News on the Advanced Remote Monitoring Project. And so here there's uh, uh, the email address, a link uh, where you can go read the article if you'd like to learn more about the project. And so with that, I uh, appreciate everyone's attention today, and uh, Dr. Shankar, I'm glad to answer any questions. Okay, uh, I'm muted myself. Uh, thank you, Clint. This is a fascinating presentation, and remember some of the early days about this uh, PA fan uh, alarm, which got the shot heard around the world indeed. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, the way we do the Q&A session is to give first chance, to, first opportunity to the students to ask questions. And so students, if you are, if you unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask the question, uh, I'm sure Clint will be happy to respond to that. So uh, students, you have the floor and your questions. Students, questions. So while they're warming up, uh, uh, a question for you, uh, Clint, is, uh, you know, the regulators play such a big role in the workforce in the nuclear industry. And how much of this technology are you exposing the regulators to so that you're not surprised by some of their decisions. Are the regulators part of this journey with you? The regulators actually are part of this journey. We're entering the third year, we're in the third year of the project and we've identified the technologies we intend to use for compliance purposes. And so we are meeting with, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, our, our sponsor there is the head of NRC's Research and Development uh, Division to help them understand the technology, how we're going to apply the technology, how we're going to mitigate the risk of problems with the technology, compact compensatory actions that would, that would be put in place if, if the new system were to fail. And so NRC is they're bringing together the various stakeholders across their organization. So it goes beyond the research and development team. We've got the regulatory enforcement organization. 
uh, within nuclear reactor regulation, uh, new reactor technologies. And so uh, all of these folks are coming, are, are becoming familiar. And the state and intent of what um, NRC's R&D group will be doing is that their intention is to come to understand the technologies and develop soft, let's say internal soft guidelines for NRC. So that when the utilities come to NRC for a license change or you know, change to how we comply, they're already familiar with the technology, they have vetted it, they've offered us feedback. So we are bringing them along on the journey as a part of this industry demonstration. Because honestly, if we can't sell this to the regulators to drive cost out of the business, it's we're wasting our time and, and our government's money. Uh, we fully intend to uh, to use this stuff for regulatory compliance, and very pleased that uh, with the positive uh, uh, reception that we've gotten from NRC to collaborate with us on this project. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions from the general audience, students included? Please unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask a question, please. I have a question. Um, Nick Coase here from the EOC program. So you say that um, nuclear plants want to be making a lot of changes to their plants in order to become lower than operation maintenance costs. But I was kind of wondering how because nuclear basically never wants to shut down and they have kind of limited refueling outages. So I'm kind of wondering how you guys go about um, making upgrades to plants and doing retrofits. Right, right. So you are you are correct, Nick. Nuclear power plants only shut down. They're very reliable capacity factors. The average capacity factor across all of our plants is uh, almost 93%, which is just amazing. And uh, they only shut down once every 18 or 24 months, depending on their depending on their fuel design. But you can do a lot of the work online. For example, um, fire automating uh, detection of fire emerging fires in the plant, automating inspections. That doesn't require a plant shutdown to to go and add, you know, this type of instrumentation and then build out. The, the supporting software and integrate everything. So large portion of what we're doing is around automation of the business, the human business practices around the plant. So, so that, those things don't require uh, a plant shutdown. Some things do, for example, online thermal performance monitoring. If it's a boiling water reactor, some of the areas that we need to put sensors in you can't access at power because of the radiation environments. We have to have a shutdown. So there are some things that have to be done during an outage, which means that means that, you know, it might be 18, 24 months uh, from the point that you're committed to going installing something that you actually get it. And that's exactly what we're doing now. We've, our plants, you know, the first year of the project, the plant, would spent part of that first year doing their design mod, their design and their development and their procurement and their staging of the equipment. And so when they came down for their next overhaul, they went and installed everything in year two. And so now in year three, everything's up and running and uh, we're now building the, the new suite module and integrating all of that, all of the data from the stuff that was installed during their, their outage opportunity. So that's the approach. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Nick, for asking the question. Questions from the audience? There's a chat box too, if you wish to place your question there. I see some uh, chat questions there, Ramesh. Yes, uh, Andy has asked an interesting question. If the POC has failed to pick up a failure, and if so, what were the consequences? Yes, the POC has failed to pick up many failures. And the consequences are very small to catastrophic, honestly. Um, the challenge is, let's say the POC didn't exist. 
all of those failures would have happened. However, there's also a very large number of failures that the POC captured and helped the plants prevent. And had the POC not existed, those, uh, those events would have, would have happened too. Uh, every time that we have a failure, uh, we, we don't see something, we evaluate our systems and what was the root cause of the failure, what, was, what is our current monitoring capability, and can we expand, can we adjust set points, can we add instrumentation, can we put in a new algorithm, and um, to help us uh, prevent the same thing from happening in the future. And, and, we don't and when we find a solution, we don't just do it for one plant, we do it for every plant. So we take that lessons learned and we codify it and we apply it to everyone. And uh, I'll just offer a couple of examples. Uh, we had a power plant trip one time because of, uh, uh, they lost control of level in their main condenser. Uh, and they tripped. Well, you know, the operators have level indication, but it's, it's a hectic in time when you're starting up or shutting down a plant. And they, they lost attention on, 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 on condenser level. Well, we never built alarms for condenser level. We never thought about it. So after that first condenser level issue, we, we built alarms and we put them on every plant. And now I can't begin to tell you how many power plant trips have been avoided because we get alarms when hot well level is deviating during plant startup conditions. Another one happened at Comanche Peak. We had a reactor trip one time because a valve uh, uh, failed online. And so the plant reactor trip, plant trip, and Comanche Peak's root cause, they determined, you know, there's a couple of signals that come out of that valve's controller. And if we monitored that, and the behavior of those outputs, we could have seen this three weeks in advance. And so they contacted the POC and said, can you monitor this for us? So we built an algorithm, pulled that data in from, from eight of these, these valves that would trip the plant. And since then, you know, a year, a year after we put that in service, guess what? We got an alarm and the failure signature matched what was happening a year earlier on the other unit. So we've avoided, I believe, three reactor trips now because the monitoring center recognized that based on the learnings from the event. So now we can't catch everything, but we take every every time we, you know, every time every time any of us fail or make a mistake, that's a learning opportunity, and that's the way we look at them, and we and we do and we do something about it when we can. Another question on the chat line, uh, uh, plant. Why would the POC have measurements that are not also available on the plant computer? That is a great question. I get that question more than most. Um, the, the thing is that in the control room, I, I worked in the control room for many years. The the volume of information that is analyzed in the monitoring center, in the POC, that would be a distraction to the operators. They would be overwhelmed uh, because our alarms in the center, we have a different mission. We're not trying to run an operating station. We're trying to analyze the performance of the station at very small levels to take actions on small issues before they could become big issues. Operators are trying to keep the unit online and their attention is fully consumed doing that task. I wouldn't want to look at all this data uh, in the control room because it would be a distraction to safely operating the nuclear reactor. It's just too much. If, if ideally, I wish I could. You know, if we could get to a point that our automated systems could do all the advanced analytics prognose the problem, how much time we have, make the notifications to the engineering organization or make the notification to the control room when continuity of, of generation is threatened at a certain level, then we could do that. But 
we're our the technology is just not mature enough to do that. It still requires, you know, for for every valid alarm that we take action on at in the monitoring center, that might be one or two out of a hundred alarms. And then people say, well, that you get 98 out of 100 false alarms. That sounds awful. No, we want false alarms because of the sensitivities. It's like, you know, we can we can tighten our sensitivities down just like blinders on a horse, and you only be able to see a very small sliver of what's in front of you. And so we're constantly tuning those to have the right sensitivity to tell us when something anomalous is going on. And then we apply human expertise to determine, is this a real issue that we need to deal with now? Is this a long-term issue or is it an instrumentation issue or is it just a, a modeling issue? And so there's this, there's a large churn that, that goes on constantly in the center, uh, filtering those alarms, managing and maintaining the alarms so that we get, we get the value contribution because again one out of a hundred one or two out of a hundred it's something that really needs attention and we we still have to rely on human investment to recognize that and to tell the people that can go and do something about it i wish we could just automate it all and port it but it's we're just not that sophisticated good answer uh Questions for Clint, we still got some time. Questions? So Clint, uh, if I may ask, uh, you know, the nuclear industry is so connected around the world. And if we have one of the most horrific scenarios play, playing out in Ukraine, with the Zaporizhia plant, which is a modern 1600 megawatt plant, you know, that is being struck by missiles. So wouldn't it make sense to share all this technology with all the nuclear operators because ultimately the safety of one depends on the safety of everybody? Absolutely. Um, we, you know, the nuclear industry, even at a on a global level, we share operating knowledge and experience like no other industry. Anytime any, any upset happens at a nuclear power plant, that information is shared with every other nuclear power plant around the globe so that we all can learn from it to, and avoid it. Uh, because there is so much sensitivity around nuclear power, if an operator at a power plant in Russia were to make a catastrophic mistake you know, at that plant, that impacts my plant here in Texas as well. And, and so we do collaborate as, as much as, um, well, we could collaborate more probably. We, we collaborate more than, than any other industry to, to share operating experience, to preserve high levels of safety and reliability because the industry depends on the success of everyone. Um, Zaporizhia, you know, honestly, that scares the heck out of me. And uh, and Rudy, I know you you appreciate as well uh, the challenges that are imposed. If you know they lose offsite power, they're on emergency diesel generators, and as long as they can keep diesel fuel in the generators, the reactor cores are safe. But given supply chain challenges, what if they can't get diesel to those to those generators? You know, the 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 outcome. If when they lose power to the cooling systems for the reactors, we will have a, you know, we're going to have, a, we will have, you know, reactor meltdowns, Chernobyl type events. Well, yeah, to that point, you know, the countries that are launched in a terrific new, new nuclear build are China, India, and UAE. I mean, it would be really nice if all of them had access to this teleautonomous capability so that. The risk of any such accident is minimized. Agreed, agreed, and that's that's really why the Department of Energy has invested in this USA initiative. Exactly. All of, everything that comes out of this will be public knowledge made available through Department of Energy. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thank again, uh, questions from the audience. If you're shy, put it in the chat box. I think we still have, well, we got, we got 10 minutes more. <laughs> I had a quick question. Uh, this is Garrett Moyer, student in the ESE program. I just wanted to get your thoughts on the future with uh, small module reactors and how they will, you know, if it'll help expand the industry, if you see that kind of shifting towards that way with the current regulatory, um, you know, environment of not too many large scale nuclear plants being built today. Um, I was yeah. just wondering if, if you think those will enable nuclear expansion in the future. Yeah, yeah small, uh, thanks for the question, Garrett. Small modular reactor technologies are very exciting, um, very encouraging. You know, we've got what, uh, let's see, X Energy, Terra Power, New Scale. Those are just three examples of next uh, small modular reactor technologies that are being uh, reviewed and approved by NRC, funded by Department of Energy to a large degree. And there's some pretty cool things with these reactors. Intrinsically safe, for example, you know, these, these reactors, if they go offline, they don't, you're not going to have a reactor meltdown. They're just, they're the big, big uh, legacy nuclear facilities were designed much different. They need large integrated cooling systems. They need large uh, uh, staff to to respond to events. But these these reactors are safe. You can just walk away from them. Some of the smaller reactors that can be transported by truck, you just drop somewhere and plug them in, and they're good for twenty years. And and when they need refueling, you, truck comes and picks them up, drops off a fresh one, and takes it back to the factory to refuel. So uh, those reactor technologies are very encouraging. And even the SMRs, you build them to size where, you know, what your, what your demand will be for power. And you can scale those to whatever level, you know, several hundred megawatts plus. And um, I think that uh, the cool thing is that that is, the, that is the future of the industry, but it will take us years and years to replace all of the legacy nuclear uh, you know it'll take probably i would say 25 to 35 years to build smr technologies to the, the current level of capability now that's one thing now think about in the meantime we're trying to decarbonize that means shutting down coal uh, shutting down a large portion of, of natural gas at the same time, we're trying to electrify everything, the transportation, everybody's driving electric cars. Just to, elect, to electrify the transportation industry, we have to double the generation capacity of our nation. So how are we going to do that with the only, the only solution, the, only, the, only, the best option is carbon-free nuclear. So building out SMR, next-gen technologies, as rapidly as we can while preserving the legacy nuclear plants that still have decades of life left in them. So the legacy nuclear can provide that bridge until SMR technologies scale to levels of production where they can compensate and offset um, you know, the reduction of fossil-based uh, generation. And, I guess one other point we see also as fossil fuels are radically reduced, uh, you know, we see also uh, investment in, in renewables, wind, solar, terrific. I love it. Grow it as fast as you can, uh, you know, but we do, but we need base load to maintain grid reliability. You got to have something base load because if the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, you ain't, you ain't generating any power. Battery technologies will help to some degree there, but you got to have something to carry the grid, and that's where uh, integration with of base, you know, nuclear is base load. Integrating that with renewables, we see that as 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 the the ideal model for let's say for the next hundred years. Great. Thank we have you. time for one more question. Who's the lucky guy? One more question. Uh, 
additional questions? Well, Clint, thank you very much. This has been a fascinating talk. Uh, it's a kind of a journey throughout the nuclear world and how important it is in our generating profile. I mean, we need to be building new plants as much as making old plants continue to operate because that's our really trusty horses that we you know, uh, can ride with. Um, uh, just one reminder, next week we'll have a seminar by uh, Deepak Ramasubramanian. We'll be talking about managing the grid with high penetration of DERs. So more green energy now, not nuclear, but uh, the sun and solar. And that's a fascinating dis uh, discussion because how do you manage a grid that has so much intermittency uh, in the resources that are utilized? Uh, that's next week at this time. Uh, Clint, thank you again. And uh, we will have Clint's uh, slides uh, available to the students, and especially those students who will be producing a podcast from Clint's talk. Um, make sure that you get a copy of that so that you can get your assignments in the time. Uh, thank you all uh, for your attention. Thank you much, Clint, and look forward to. Uh, uh, you are, your participation with Lehigh University. Thank you all. Have a have a great bye -bye. Uh, rest of the week. Bye bye. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.